Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're ready to get started. Um, good news. We've actually got a two for one today. Uh, we're going to walk through uh, delivering an application on a, on a platform. We we'll talk about platforms and operators and the like. And we're also going to use this opportunity to introduce you all to Tag App Delivery and what we do and how you can contribute. Um, before we start, I just wanted to ask if you could raise your hand. How many people here have read or referenced the GitOps principles? Nice, nice. And how many people have read the operator's white paper or referenced it or used it? Okay. And one last question. Um, who here is a title or is part of a team that's called platform engineers or platform team? Okay, we've got quite a few of those. Well, you'll, the reason I'm asking is because actually the GitOps principles, the operator white paper, and right now we just released the platform white paper, that's come from this group the past, past two or three years. So uh, thank you for benefiting from our work. We hope it benefited you. Um, all right, so let us now introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Josh Gavan. I am a solution architect with Red Hat and one of the technical leads for Tag App Delivery. Yes, hello, my name is Tom Schütz. I'm tech lead of the CNCF Tag App Delivery. Furthermore, I'm consultant, educator, CNCF, CDF ambassador, and whatever. Um, and yes, happy to meet you all here. Hello, I am Jennifer Stradjevic. I work for Canos and I am a co-chair of the Tag App Delivery. Very happy to be here. Um, just a quick through, run through of the agenda, already mentioned by Josh, but we are going to just talk a little bit about uh, our Tag, the mission and a few updates. Uh, Josh is going to go through the platforms, the work with the op uh, platforms white paper. I'm going to go through a bit about operators uh, and uh, some of the changes in the landscape uh, in the last couple of years. And we went with Thomas talking about what is a cloud native application and trying to define that. Um, so uh, who, we, who are we, right? Have you, if you have heard of us, uh, we enable, we help uh, end users and uh, uh, projects by providing some unbiased feedback and uh, also onboarding new contributors um, and matching like trying to help both sides. Um, we uh, provide some advice on projects that want to join the landscape, the CNCF landscape, sandbox or incubation. Uh, we also provide uh, some materials like white papers for people who want to get on board onto uh, the open source world and the cloud native. Um, we also uh, uh, help facilitate uh, working groups, creation, and uh, um, yeah, by by providing um, one like some structure and uh, helping form them as well. So. One of the working groups that we have is the platforms. Then uh, we had uh, uh, the operators <coughs> working group, which was uh, short-lived. Uh, throughout the time we've created the operator white paper, we are trying to get a new version now, so it's coming back. Uh, a new working group that's coming is Artifacts, and we also have the uh, GitOps working group. Um, I'll hand it to uh, Josh. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna start off by talking about platforms and showing an application deployed seamlessly, quickly, flexibly, efficiently on a platform. Um, I, I put this picture because I, when I think of platforms, I think of uh, at people supporting each other, being able to build on the shoulders of giants. So here you see how high one person could get when they've got a lot of other people helping them. So we're going to talk about what exactly a platform is, or at least the opinion that we've put in the paper, um, and, how, and how they can help with app development, a little bit about why. Um, I'll show you a demo, and then maybe we'll go a little into the, the capabilities and attributes. So what and why. Um, yeah, so in 
the consensus that we reached working on the paper was that a platform consolidates, brings together a collection of capabilities for that, that an application needs in a consistent, coherent, directed way uh, based on the, the real needs of, of the user of the platform. Um, so for example, in the cloud native world, bringing together observability services, uh, database services, event buses, artifact management, all these different things that need to come together for your application to work, the platform provides consistent interfaces and consistent ways to get at them, and also to integrate them. Let's not, let's not leave that out. Um, part of the purpose of the, the paper that we wrote, and I want to talk a little about why, is that we wanted to enable platform engineers or leaders of platform engineers to convince uh, to convince their enterprise, like, look, if you want to move forward with cloud native development and really maximize the value of it, you should adopt this platform model. Um, and so we put a lot of whys in there too. Some of them include, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the term cognitive load. Make it easier for your app developers to focus on the task at hand, the business logic at hand, and not all the collection of stuff that's underneath. Um, Instead of having many, many teams building the, that full stack underneath, dedicate a team that becomes an, a set of experts on this, it becomes much more resilient, reliable. Um, we mentioned, oh, oh, uh, sharing. If you have a common platform, it becomes much easier to share code, to share knowledge, to share people even. It's much easier to switch teams. Um, it reduces risk. It, it, this kind of is reflected in the kind of funnel shape here. It's a choke point here for all the code going into production where you can apply policies, you can apply security checks, you get a little bit of control. Um, and it also enables, a lot of times, this bottom layer, you might think it's uh, you know, data centers that you maintain or something like that, but it could also be cloud providers. But you, want to, you can't just, I mean, maybe you can. A lot of times you can't just throw out cloud services and say, oh, use them. You need to provide a consistent way that fits in your enterprise. So it also enables you really to better use all of the software as a service and provider capabilities. So tell your CEO that. <laughs> um, yeah, so here I just wanted to illustrate, uh, here's all that platform stuff that we illustrated before. Here I put, kind, actually I built this app a long time ago. Uh, but it's a, you know, a typical logical diagram of all the components that have to interact in a cloud native app. And interestingly, and I, I think I mentioned this in the last slide, like it becomes distributed. I mean, cloud native and distributed are they're, they're pretty closely related. Um, but I like this because it kind of shows you, I didn't want to draw lines because that you would never be able to even see this page, but it kind of shows you how all of these pieces get pulled into an app and integrated. So with that, I wanted to show just a quick example of, this is just an API service. Let me see if I can get it to come on over. Come on over. Oops. Must be going the wrong way. Sorry, folks. There we go. Um, yeah, I wanted to give an example of a set of capabilities, making up a platform, and then an app writing on top of them. So let me just make that a tiny bit bigger. So I'm sure first to show you the end result, actually, which is it's just the widgets API. I'm sure that's hard to read up there, but it's just <laughs> host name slash widgets, and it's just returning a list of widgets that I inserted. That's the end result. But it's using a database. I could actually show you it's got Jaeger tracing established on it. Uh, it's using a, a bucket for some stuff. It's got a certificate. Um, it's been deployed by Argo CD, by GitOps. Uh, forgive me, I'm using OpenShift here, but it's Operator Lifecycle Manager in behind the scenes, which is part of Operator Framework, which is uh, allowing all these operators to be quickly installed. So I've installed a database provider, I've installed distributed tracing, a couple different parts, which gives me open telemetry. Uh, I've got Minio, which gives me buckets, Cert Manager. So this is kind of my platform in this case, you know, my capabilities. Um, and this gives me, remember we said that consistent, coherent interface, these are all just Kubernetes manifests. Uh, so I've got a build, this OpenShift has a built-in build controller, so you, that wasn't in the list before, but I've got a build, I've got a certificate, I've got my configuration, images is a way OpenShift stores, so that's my artifact storage for my 
images. Instrumentation gets me open telemetry installed. PGDB, I'll just open one of them for easy. I mean, I don't have to go through all of them, but look, that's the simplest of things. Um, and then of course, there's a customization and it all gets deployed out by, and Thomas is gonna talk more about this, but here's an application YAML, and that kind of expresses, pick up all that stuff, put it into the cluster. I've already done it, I'm not gonna do it right now, but then you end up seeing, here's that entire application uh, or actually the core code, I didn't even show you the code of the application, it's in another repo. But here I've just, with that set of manifests, deployed the application, taken, integrated all that capability from the platform right into it, uh, and there we go. Much easier than having to build that whole thing from scratch. Let's close that out. Um, so the next step that I probably would take with this app if I was building a platform would be to templatize that and say, oh, you're looking to build an API server, and here's the, here's the standard framework for all the components you're gonna need in your API server. Because that's also an important part of a platform is templates. Um, the last significant thing I wanted to go over, in the paper we have functional attributes or functional components that you might wanna consider for your platform. Here these are the non-functional ones. Um, we really wanna emphasize and we really wanna help you all and we're working on some stuff with that product mindset. You gotta, you gotta really emphasize with your app developers and, and understand what they need and try to understand if what you're providing meets those needs and iterate with them. Um, that kind of fits in with the next one, developer experience. Your, your core is to let those platform users have a good experience. Documentation, self-service, things should be automated. I can click and get it as much as possible. Reduce cognitive load, you wanna abstract and encapsulate. Um, as much as you can. Um, optional, there's always gonna be people that wanna go around, um, composable, and of course, secure by default, like we mentioned. The last one of my slides, I don't have a timer here, but I hope I'm not taking all of Jen and Thomas's time. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Actually, there's some, this is what's listed in the paper as capabilities <laughs> to consider, uh, you know, in a platform, and people have been looking at these. It's got some synergies with landscape, and we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about that with them, um, but this, a lot of people had eyes on this and we felt this represented the things that you should look at and think about including in your platform. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen and she's gonna tell you about operators. Thank you, Josh. Hi everyone, I'm going to talk quickly about operators um, and how they aid uh, platforms and applications. So, um, as you know, on Kubernetes, uh, the primitives uh, like deployment, pods, and replica sets, they are like operators behind the scenes, and uh, the operator pattern and operators came to provide uh, developers and pro uh, platform engineers with ways to customize that, create custom resources and uh, controllers to uh, manage those resources in the same way as you do manage like a deployment or something. Um, that uh, abstraction also allowed for platform toil to be reduced with the same kind of automation as you would do for life, uh, application lifecycle management. And also, um, uh, these operator patterns over the years have uh, evolved so much that they matured beyond Kubernetes itself. Uh, so just quickly going through, um, basic operator reconciliation uh, example here diagram. Um, it's on the operator white paper as well. Uh, you uh, have your business uh, language, your business domain knowledge uh, that you apply into a uh, uh, custom resource that you declare, that you, you create for uh, uh, users to declare uh, based on your needs. Um, you then implement um, a controller uh, implement uh, a watch that will be watching this resource and uh, matching it against the uh, current state in the cluster and it's going to take actions, apply changes to reconcile those. Uh, you also will report them. Um, and my view on this is that uh, the operators make platforms more uh, product-like, as Josh mentioned with the uh, platform capabilities. Uh, you think of it as a product because you want, you can, uh, that allows you to develop ways to 
uh, and, and to provide a foundation for uh, creating portals and the CLIs so people can um, consume that in, in a more um, product way, uh, I'd say. And uh, one example of this is, uh, let's say, a, a user journey that could be is like a developer trying to consume a database, create a database. Um, and I will show you an example of Crossplane, for example, uh, which uses, um, leverages CRDs and uh, controllers in order to provide um, user, uh, a couple of personas in this case, for example, a developer has only to concern, has lower cognitive load, like um, Josh said, um, on just concerning themselves with their knowledge about the application and uh, on the infrastructure side, all they need to know is like what kind of database they need. They just need to worry about designing the database. So they decide that they need a NoSQL. They, they decide about the performance they need and uh, the size, for example. So uh, the uh, Crossplane provides a way using operators to, for you to declare your ubiquitous business language, I'd say, um, via uh, custom resources. And then uh, the other persona, the operator here, which is, would be your platform operator, will then declare their business policies and uh, ways that, um, what means a fast database. And uh, for example, a, a provider could be cloud provider, could be uh, on-premises API. So it's um, totally, uh, abstracted from the developer these details that the operator would be concerned with. Uh, next. Um, so um, another thing that is also available on the operator white paper, it's some of uh, interesting operator patterns that came, uh, emerged over the years. And one uh, of them that I'm going to talk about quickly is this uh, operator of operators which is basically an operator that's concerned with managing other operators uh, that have other concerns. So for the user that consumes this operator, they are seeing just one, but in, uh, in fact, in the actual uh, implementation, it's uh, other operators that are being um, installed by those and uh, being uh, managed by uh, this uh, meta operator, let's say. Um, a few popular uh, operator frameworks you probably heard of since you answered <laughs> Josh's question in the beginning. Uh, script Builder, uh, the operator framework. Uh, interestingly, there is a few, uh, in, with the landscape changes now, there are some emerging operator frameworks that you couldn't read about as well. It's like Meta Controller, which again is similar to the idea before, but it's a, um, just a way to create those um, meta controllers um, as a service. And also there is Juju, that's model-driven operator framework that is um, catered for more enterprise use cases, multi-cloud, and actually transport the operator. Um, you can create operators like outside of Kubernetes, not using the same like reconcile uh, patterns. So it's just quite interesting, you should check out. Um, and yes, I've been talking about the operator white paper quite a lot now, and uh, we uh, have made some changes since the, uh, the publication, which was in 2021, the first version. But uh, as you may know, like for example, GitOps was like 1.0 version and like lots of changes have happened. And uh, we added a few more things. Uh, in there, it's like constant changing, but I would like to call you to tell me your story about your usage of operators as well. And uh, either talk to us through in the meetings that we have by monthly and also on the Slack channel. And also you can submit a PR on our GitHub. Um, and uh, yeah, so the Slack channel and take a look at our blog that we made. Tom is gonna show a bit, little, a bit more, but we have a new uh, website very nice. <laughs> Please, I will hand to you then to talk about applications now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, I can also uh, only encourage every one of you to um, contribute to such white papers or whatever. For Jennifer and me, this was the way into the, into the tag, and it was very much fun to work on such a white paper. So, um, 
Yes, as announced previously, um, I will talk a bit about applications. And as I said before, I'm, I'm a teacher. So um, to, uh, who wants to tell me what an application is? Uh, has anyone an opinion, an opinion of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> A collection of services that provide business or end user value. Thank you. Um, another one? Executable. An executable? Okay. Yarek? <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I would say there's not a, a one, one, one definition of application, but uh, from a um, perspective, but business perspective, it could be a set of services that yeah. serve one business stuff, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, as you as you heard now, um, it's it was a bit of a, of an easy example. Normally, normally when you talk to three people about applications, um, you get five opinions. Um, and I think the same is about applications in a Kubernetes environment. So at the moment, there's, in, at least in my opinion, not a, a really clear definition of what an application is. So in the first step, I just want to um, show a bit um, how cloud native applications are described normally. So sorry, the, there's too much light. Um, so we have an application. This application consists of, uh, could consist of one service or multiple services. So um, in fact, the, the application is more or less a boundary um, for a thing which fulfills a business purpose. Um, in this application, the services should be able to scale independently. So when we find out that one service is um, is overloaded or whatever, we should be able to scale it um, alone and not have to scale all of them. And finally, we could describe that the infrastructure and the configuration can be seen as part of this service. So far, so good. So that's what I understand as a service. Oh, as an application, sorry. Um, and now, so we talked a bit of what is an application. Um, and you might, you might um, ask yourself, what is the problem now? <laughs> um, at first, we are living in a cloud native world and all of us are thinking that services should be always developed and tested individually. That's the thing we read in the books. <laughs> in fact, it's always different. So um, there's a lot of, service, of applications out there which are more or less micro monoliths which are tested, developed, and so on together, um, which are multiple services, but only work in a certain version combination. Furthermore, when we deploy things in Kubernetes, we know that our workloads are running. We know that they are, they are most probably in the state we defined somewhere, um, but we never know when the application de the deployment is finished. So there is no resource at the moment in Kubernetes which tells us if in which state the application is. Um, the same um, is there for workload and application health checks. So we always know that a, a, a workload is running technically. So we define some, somewhere in our manifest that we want to have three replicas, we want to have um, resource limits, resource requests, and so on. Um, we know that we want to have these environment variables and maybe we want to have, uh, we have some health checks which help us defining if our application is somehow running um, or if our services is running. But in fact, um, these are only scoped to the services. We don't know if the application is running. And last but not least, um, there's a standardization issue. So there are application definitions out there, but um, if we have five application definitions from different vendors, we don't know how to switch between them. 
So, some weeks ago, I sat down a bit and um, investigated a bit about application definitions, and I will show you some results afterwards. But at the moment, I found three types of application definitions. The first one are application definitions where the whole application, so all of the deployments, services, um, and so on, are defined in one resource. This is, for example, in Open Application Model and in Qvilla. The second ones are the, th are the, are the types of application um, definitions where a source to the, to the uh, where reference to the source is stored in the resource. Many of you, I think, uh, know Argo CD. Um, this is one of the things where we simply reference to a Git repository, but we don't have sim single resources defined. Um, the second one I found here was Carver and Cap. The third one is uh, an application definition where the reference to objects is stored in the, in the resource definition. And this is how Captain operates at the moment. Okay, so um, as I said before, some weeks ago I sat down, um, I took our demo application, the potato head, and try to deploy it with various um, um, application definitions. So just out of cu curiosity, the um, Potato Head was a demo application which was created for KubeCon NA, I think 2021, 2020. And what you're seeing here um, is, a is an application which consists of six services. So the body of the Potato Head is one service, the left arm is a service, the right arm is a service, and the same for the legs. Um, you can put arms up and down and so on, and this is also a thing which is done in the tech app delivery. So um, what we are doing in the, in the tech is not, uh, is not always very, very serious, but I think <laughs> this, is, um, this is a very, very funny example of, of funny work you could have in the tech. Okay, so this, this was Josh's entry point. This. <laughs> okay, so then let's take a look on the first application definition. This is. Well, where are we? There. Sorry, I'm not used to working with, <laughs> with this. Um, Okay, so this is a typical application definition of Argo CD. Um, we see that this is an application, this is called a Potato Head. Um, yes, and so on. The interesting part of this is we only have a reference to a Git repository, which tells us <laughs> that everything what's there in this Git repository is the application. But we don't know from this definition how many workloads we have, which configuration we have, and so on. Um, in the second example, um, this is for the, for the open applica application model, uh, which is used by Kubila. And there we see the application is defined in a very different way. Um, in fact, this is also an application, uh, only of a, uh, with a different API behind it. But what we see in this, in this defini uh, definition here, we have all of the, comp uh, of the components in there, such as uh, front-end service, um, I think left-arm service, right-arm service, and however they are called. We have all of the environment variables, all of the configuration, and so on in one manifest. Um, it's also a very, uh, very valid way. And in the third case, we have the captain way. Um, where we simply have references to such things. So in this case, um, the deployments and so on are simply annotated with a name and a version, and the application manifest simply put, uh, puts down all of them together. So as you see, we have three tools and three different opinions. Um, and there is, at the moment, no way to switch between them. So to get back to the slides. Um, 
And this is where we are at the moment. So um, the whole application definition topic is a very new one in the tech at the moment. Um, and this is a question I have to you. Is anyone interested, uh, has anyone such problems um, that uh, you don't have application definition, uh, uh, standardized application definitions and would need one? At least one, so it's a good idea to do this. Um, okay, so um, if, if you were afraid of, raise your hand, of raising your hand um, and you are interested in this topic, just feel free to reach out to us. And if you know more than the app, than the app uh, definitions I've showed you until now, um, so these were only three examples. I have two, two three, four another ones. Um, you can always pro provide examples for the potato head. So this was the initial thought of the service to showcase how such application deployments could look like, how such scenarios could look like, and to always have them testable. What we want to get out of this application, um, of this whole application um, things, uh, maybe a proposal for a standard. Maybe we could provide some provide some new project out of this and so on. Um, we only also want to create blog posts. So we we started a few months ago and a white paper in a working group. And as I said before, we want to provide some examples. Um, yes, um, this was the application part. Now, um, to wrap this up a bit. Some weeks ago, a uh, member of the tech um, was, so, was so nice and started creating a website for the tech app delivery. <coughs> this is there under tech app delivery CNCFIO. And what you can find here are all of the white papers we have created, all of the blogs and so on. You can also find um, meeting, uh, meeting times and the nice, nice thing of this, with this white paper section here, we could um, change our white papers to a more or less rolling release model. So we can update them in place. And when you are looking at the white papers there, you always have the newest version. Um, and some of you might ask or might not ask what you could do for the tag. And the first thing would be if you have use cases, experiences, and so on about um, cloud native application delivery, we are really glad to hear this. So the things we are doing there should not be academics. They should help, help you, they should, and you should, they should help other end users, but also our projects to involve. Um, so if you, if you are doing cool things, just get in touch with us and um, you can always show this in some of our tech meetings. You can always visit our website and uh, read our white papers. You can always provide examples to the potato head and you can um, support the tag in its technical domains. So at the moment, um, we have the, as, as we said before, the platforms working group, there is um, the, the work on the operator white paper. We might want to do something on OCI artifacts, on applications, and so on. So there's enough work for everyone if someone wants to work something. Okay, so um, I think this was it from our side. Um, thank you for being here, and yes, have a, have a nice rest of the KubeCon. I, sorry, um, are there some questions? So uh, kind of combining both topics with the operator and app delivery. Um, so if you don't have access to the operator lifecycle manager, um, is there any type of push to treat operator? Or what's the reasoning behind the operator lifecycle manager? If you don't have access to one, and can you just use your typical app delivery means to deliver operators? Yeah, uh, actually, you could. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I have a repo full of operators or capabilities that I add into my clusters, and one of them is a Helm chart. One of them you download a CLI tool and you run it. One of them you run a special uh, like in certain clusters you'll run a special uh, add-on add. So the advantage of operator lifecycle manager, and you can install it in any Kubernetes as part of operator framework, is that it gives you a marketplace and gives you a way to 
you actually, the way it works is you create a subscription and then it will install it for you. So it's a common way to discover and install operators. The other option would be just find each individual one. It says install the Helm chart, do it that way. So, so that's, that's the advantage of, I think it's something to think about, like some consistency across clusters in that. Um, but yeah, operator lifecycle manager is one option. Does that, does that help? Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, we're here for the next couple of minutes. If you want to talk, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.